you have your Bible, and I hope you do, I want to invite you to join me in Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. What a joy and delight to be here, especially to hear such great things about the message that Brother Larry Wynn, my boss, my friend, shared with you this morning. I'm glad you liked it. I, I worked hard on that message and gave it to him so he'd have something to preach. Ephesians chapter 2. This is my second time to Marie Baptist Church a couple of years ago. Uh, your pastor graciously allowed us to host one of our state uh, meetings here, a training event here, uh, in uh, partnership with my dear friend Bobby Jones, your association missionary, and uh, always love coming back. Appreciate your pastor so very much. Uh, he's well thought of by our staff and the people that I know that know him, and uh, it's just a joy to be back with you on a Sunday evening. By the way, it was 70 degrees when I left my house this morning in Barney, Georgia. 70. Now, if you don't know where Barney is, Barney is a sleepy little suburb of the greater Hayhira Metroplex, <laughs> which, which is 10 miles north of Valdosta, which is 15 miles north of the Florida line, right down 75. But uh, I was this morning, I was in uh, O'Quinn Baptist Church in Screven, Georgia, and they get to be with you uh, tonight. It's an, indeed an honor and a joy and a privilege. I'm going to be very quick tonight, I'm going to talk fast, you listen fast, and we'll wind up at the same place at the same time. Uh, I'm going to endeavor to share with you uh, some training, some teaching uh, that I put together in what I call No Fear Evangelism. And the reason I call it No Fear Evangelism is because a good friend of mine by the name of Ed Stetzer, when he was head of research for Lifeway, uh, did research to find out uh, just how uh, effective or how much church folks participated in telling other folks about the Lord Jesus. He put a survey in the field and found out uh, an astonishing fact. Here was the question. Do you intend in the next 12 months, do you intend in the next 12 months to endeavor to share the gospel with a lost or unchurched person? 92% said, nope, not going to do that. 92%. Of church attending evangelicals, folks who attend church regularly, who believe the same thing that you and I believe about the Bible, said, no, don't plan to do that. So I began doing some research across the nation. Uh, every time I was speaking at a pastor's training event or speaking at a church or uh, at a conference, and I would ask a simple question. Why do you think church folks don't tell other folks about Jesus? Now, I, I took all the answers and I put them together. They really boil down to about five different answers, and they all begin with the letter S. Now, I'm going to give you a pop quiz here to start this off, and I want you to see if you can get the first one correct, the number one reason why church folks don't tell the folks about Jesus. But I want to warn you, uh, in the, you see, five, six, seven, eight, nine years I've been a state missionary in the area of evangelism, discipleship, and church strengthening, no group has ever gotten it wrong. Don't let me down. Five reasons church folks don't tell other folks about Jesus. They all begin with the letter S. The number one answer is because they are number one answer. Number one answer. Do you want to play or pass? Number one answer. They're scared. Now, the other answer is really unpacked from under that. They're scared because they're shallow in their understanding. They don't know what to say. They don't know the gospel. Number two is they have shame because of sin. They, they're carrying unconfessed sin in their heart. They feel convicted, condemned, guilty. Uh, and then thirdly, because, the, uh, because they're self-righteous. They feel that they go to heaven based on how good they live. Therefore, other people will get to heaven on how good they live, which is not true. Fourthly, it's because they're not sure that they're saved or they're not saved. So those are the five primary reasons, and I'm going to address all of them in two things I'm going to do with you tonight, and I, my prayer is, and my intention, and I believe God's desire for us is to leave here with all of our fear of sharing the Lord Jesus with anybody is completely alleviated. Now, one of the reasons that, that many people uh, have that, that reluctance to share the gospel is they don't realize uh, that their job is not to save lost people. I've got news. None of you will ever save a lost person. God saves the lost. We sow the seed. So our task is in the power of the Holy Spirit to share the gospel 
and let the work of God in their hearts uh, bring them to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. So I'm going to share these things with you very, very quickly. And we're going to start in Ephesians chapter 2. Dean and Sarah is uh, uh, pastor of City Church in Tallahassee, Florida. Dean uh, recently wrote an, a tremendous article about the challenges of ministry in the Bible Belt. We're Southerners. Uh, I'm going to imagine most all of us in this room are Southern. And here's what that means. It means that our men are stronger. Our ladies are prettier. Our children are sweeter. And bless the Lord, our food tastes better. But a lot of Southerners have been raised in church all their life, but they've never clearly heard the gospel preached or explained to them regularly. I do a lot of training with pastors, and sometimes I work with them with their preaching. You won't be able to tell it tonight, but I actually do work with them on their preaching. And there are essentially three different kinds of preachers in Georgia. There are expository preachers. Those are the ones who will take a text like I'm about to in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, and they walk, walk through that one passage of Scripture. Expository. Another uh, ta uh, style of preaching is topical. Uh, it's where you take a particular topic and you talk about that one verse of topic, and then you choose from different places in the Bible uh, to support what you're communicating about that particular topic. As a matter of fact, my Easter sermon, um, I'm interim pastor at Mountain Park First Baptist Church at Stone Mountain, uh, is seven words. It's Acts 13, 30, one verse, uh, but God raised him from the dead. There it is. Four points. Because he lives, there's no problem he cannot solve. There's no promise he cannot keep. There's no prayer he cannot answer. There's no person he cannot change. Yes, I have preached that message before. That's why I've got it fresh in my mind, but that's, going to, that's a topical message. Now, the third type of preacher we have in the great state of Georgia is what I call a P and P preacher. A P and P preacher is someone who simply picks a verse and then pitches a fit. Doesn't necessarily have to do with that one verse that they pick, but they just let loose. They're all over the place. Well, in that kind of preaching, when you don't teach people the whole counsel of the Word of God, they don't know really what the gospel is. Being Southerners, we love our mamas, and we believe in Jesus because mama told us to. And a lot of people in the church today, you would say, how do you go to heaven? You, you believe in Jesus. But if we don't know what it is you're believing about Jesus, you don't know the gospel. So all I'll do is share my testimony, and I think that's wonderful. I want you to be able to share your testimony of how you came to faith in Jesus Christ. But your testimony is the sermon illustration. It is not the sermon. It's not the gospel message. Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God and salvation to everyone who believes. And so I want to share with you a little encapsulated gospel understanding tonight before we go to another step of uh, application. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Now, in Ephesians chapter 2, Paul just drops in. It just starts in chapter 2, verse 1. Uh, Paul says, you know, he's talking, and he start, he's, not, he's continuing a thought from chapter 1. When you go back to chapter 1, you will see that um, Paul, first of all, has given this amazing example of God's extravagant grace. Uh, he says in verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. Talk about amazing grace for God to take the first New Testament terrorist who literally put Christians to death, tried to demolish the church, and tried to eradicate the name of Jesus from the face of the earth. And for God to save him, not only save him, but to call him to be an apostle and a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is God's grace personified. And then verses 3 through 14, Paul will begin explaining to the church at Ephesus who they are in Christ. Now, I want to I do more than ask. I want to beg. I want to urge. I want to beseech you, the, therefore, my brethren, to do a study in Ephesians 1, 3 through 14. And I want you to just, whether in your Bible or in a journal or a piece of paper, take notes and mark. Every time it says, in him, or in Christ, or in the beloved. And you're going to learn who you are in Christ. 
learning who God says you are by way of your saving relationship with him in Jesus Christ will give you greater confidence and assurance and boldness in overcoming any fear you have of telling other folks about Jesus. Then in verse 15, Paul begins to pray. Paul is the classic New Testament ADHD poster child. Um, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder Paul that's what I call him because that's one of the things he and I share a lot that and he and I both are competing to see who indeed was the chief of sinners but Paul just can go along in a passage and all of a sudden pff, he's right over here squirrel in another direction well Paul starts talking about who we are in Christ and then he says church let me tell you the thing I'm praying for you and he prays three things in verses 15 through the end of the chapter. He says, I'm praying that you'll have a spirit of revelation in the knowledge of him. Now, that's going to be very important for us. We need to know who this Christ is who has redeemed us, who has saved us. We, Paul, oh, excuse me, uh, Jesus said in John 17, 3, this is eternal life, that they may know him, the one true God, and his son, Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. That's eternal life. You and I will spend our Christian lives growing in the revelation, the knowledge, the wisdom of who the Lord Jesus Christ is and our relationship with God through him. He said of all, he prays that we'll, have, uh, we'll, we'll come to know the exceeding riches of our inheritance as saints as the children of God. Those, those spiritual riches that God has given to us, his, his power, his joy, his peace. I was thinking about a verse this morning uh, driving across the South Georgia countryside. It's Romans 15, 13. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that by the power of the Holy Spirit you might have um, an abundance of hope. Uh, and so just tremendous truth of what God provides us by his saving grace. You are saved by grace through faith, but beloved, you must needs live the Christian life by grace through faith. And then Paul finishes that prayer saying, I'm praying to this church so that they might know the exceeding riches of the power of God made available to them. And that power, he says, is measured according to the power by which he raised his son Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, yes, Paul wrote this letter to the church at Ephesus, but it was the inspired word of God. It is. The inspired word of God is God breathed it is God truth and even though this letter was written about 1956 years ago on parchment paper because it is the living God it is every bit as real every bit is relevant and every bit is powerful because God has inspired his written as his inerrant infallible powerful living word so we're going to look at Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 through 10. The reason I picked that passage is a good friend of mine was my former pastor. I just moved to South Georgia. Uh, this, this isn't South Georgia. I love you. You're in middle Georgia. You're a little far north middle Georgia, but you're in middle Georgia. Um, I'm from South Georgia where gnats are for breakfast. And it's just, that's where I'm from. Um, but I moved from, from Duluth. Uh, near the Mall of Georgia, uh, down to our home now uh, in Barney, Georgia, Hurricane Irma weekend. Uh, it was a lot of fun. And uh, but when I, before I moved, uh, we were members of Cross Point Church in Duluth. Uh, a man who's been a friend of mine for many years was our pastor, a guy named James Merritt. And I was never at church. I'm never at my home church. My wife goes and takes my offering envelope, and James said, that's all, that's all, that's all good. Whether you show up or not, as long as you send her and that, that offering envelope, you're good. But James and I would stay in touch by phone calls and text messages and everything. He sent me a picture one time of him standing following the uh, golf tournament uh, with a caddy. It was a, ca a golf tournament where you actually didn't ride in a cart, but you walked and you had a caddy. And it captioned, he, the, he sent the text message to me was this. Hey, just want to let you know I led my caddy to Christ during the tournament today. And I thought that was amazing. He and I talked a little bit about that. Later on, he took his wife on a 40th wedding anniversary trip to Ireland and Scotland, during which time he played golf 11 times. I, you don't even want to go there. 
During those 11 times, he led, I can't remember if it was five or seven of his caddies to Christ. And I said, okay, doc, that does it. Call him up. How do you do that? How do you share the gospel? Here's what he told me. Randy, it's a simple thing. I just use bad news, worse news, good news, best news. As a matter of fact, if you were to go online and look at the North American Mission Board, he recorded a short video that gives an overview of his gospel presentation. Bad news, worse news, good news, best news. So I'm going to take this passage of scripture tonight. I'm going to walk through it rather quickly. I'm going to give you a little extra stuff with this. Now, I don't spend 15, 20, 30 minutes sharing the gospel that often because I usually don't have 15, 20, or 30 minutes to do that. A lot of times, my gospel sharing takes place in a Starbucks. It's the place I get to hang out with lost people. I live in a Christian house. I get in a Christian car, and I drive to Christian churches to talk to Christian people usually. So I have to be intentional about being around lost people. And so as I travel, Starbucks is a place to do that. And I can have a conversation with them. Um, so when I do that, and they usually are talking to me about things they're going through, challenges they're facing. With all integrity, I can say, you know, I've gone through exactly what you're talking about. If you'll give me a couple of minutes, I'll tell you how I came out on the other side. If they say yes, they've just given me permission. And so I talk about to them about the bad news the worst news, the good news, the best news. It just so happens Ephesians 2 follows in that particular uh, context. If you'll look at Ephesians chapter 2, I'm going to begin in verse 1. Remember, Paul has just finished talking about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. If you found Ephesians 2, say, I found it. Verse 1. And the first two words there are, and you. And so when I read out loud, and you, if you're a believer here tonight, I want you to think in your mind, that's me, okay? And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now is at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom all we once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the flesh and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Verse 4, what's that word? Conjunction, junction, what's your function? For those of you who ever watched Schoolhouse Rock, you'll know that the conjunction but erases everything to the left and replaces it with everything to the right. Romans 6, 23. For the wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We've just seen who we are without Christ in verses 1 through 3. Now we get to verse 4, but this is that conjunction. This is where things change. Look at what it says. It says in verse 4. See if I can get it. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love, with which he loved us, even while we were dead in our sin and trespass, has raised us up together and made us alive together in Christ. For by grace have you been saved. And he has seen us together in heavenly places, on his right hand, in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace... Have you been saved through faith? And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Let's pray. Father, speak. Give us ears to hear and hearts to do. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, bad news, worse news, good news, best news. And we need to understand how the bad news came, became bad news. Because it wasn't always bad news. As a matter of fact, when God Almighty created everything there is by the word of his power, through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, he took dirt and he took the dirt, the dust of the earth, and he fashioned and formed a man. And he breathed into that man the, his very breath, and man became a living soul. We were shaped, we were formed, we were created by Almighty God in His image. And Adam and Eve had wonderful, untrammeled relationship, fellowship with the Lord God Almighty. There was no sin, there was no sorrow, there was no sickness, none of those things. Sin had not come into the world. They had perfect union with God in their relationship with Him. But then they chose to rebel and disobey 
God's one commandment, not to eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They were enticed, they were tempted, and they decided to take what God said don't do because they think that would be they thought that would be better for them than what God said, for what God was providing, and sin entered to the human race. Now the Bible says the soul that sins shall die. God himself had said to them, uh, do not eat the fruit of this tree, for the day that you eat it, thou shalt die. Now they didn't eat that fruit and just drop dead, but spiritually they died. They were physically alive, but spiritually dead to the Lord. So when I'm talking about the bad news, there are three or four things actually found in the first three verses. Without Christ, without a relationship with Jesus Christ. The first thing is we're dead in our sin. Now, to help people understand this, I'm talking about Mother's Day. In South Georgia, if you loved your mommy, you gave her a cassage on Mother's Day. If her mother was living, you gave her a cassage made with red flowers. If her mother was no longer with us, you gave her a cassage of white flowers. And the bigger the cassage, the more it showed you loved your mama. And so, uh, there they were. I went to Miss Blanche's flower shop, always got my mama a big white cassage. Now, here's the truth. That corsage looked pretty. It smelled pretty. Everybody bragged on her corsage. The truth is, the moment those flowers were clipped and separated from the flower bush, they died. And sin separates us from God. That's why we need this reconciliation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. But sin separates us from God, and, and we can't fix that. Sin separates us from the life of God. The second thing we see in that verse 2 is that, that our being apart from Christ, we're dominated by Satan. It says that we're held under his sway. Paul would write in Romans 6 that we are slaves to sin. Third thing is that we're driven by lust. You know, the Holy Spirit uh, uh, rules and reigns in our hearts and lives as believers. But if we're not believers, if we're without Jesus Christ, the only thing we have to live according to is whatever our body and our mind says to do. And it's driven by the evil world system over which Satan rules and reigns. And so we live according to the lustful desires of the flesh and the mind and are by nature children of wrath, which is the fourth characteristic of a person without Christ. Dead in sin, dominated by Satan, driven by lust. But the latter part of verse 3, it talks about our being destined for the wrath of God. Now one of the things that uh, somewhere along the way fell off the bus of evangelism was any mention about the consequences of dying without Christ. But in all actuality in the Gospel of Matthew where we have more of the public, recorded public preaching and teaching of Jesus, for every one reference he makes to heaven, he makes three references to hell. So you and I need to have at least a working understanding of the wrath of God. The wrath of God is what everyone in this room deserves. If we got what we deserved, every one of those in this room, if we got what we deserved, we'd bust hell wide open. Why? Because we have sinned and rebelled against holy God. That which was created by God from the dust of the earth has shaken our, we've shaken our fist at God and say, I demand my way. I want, to, I want to walk in my way, not your way. I don't want to obey you. I want to obey me. I want to be the ruler of my life. I want to follow what I think is best. And we've sinned against God, and that, that necessitates, even though God is love, he is also just. And we, by the consequence of our sin, are recipients of the wrath of God. I could preach to you about hell tonight and the judgment of unbelievers before God. I don't have time for that. But for your information tonight, just so you have a working understanding of the wrath of God and the judgment for unbelievers, the Bible says that hell is a place of total darkness, total loneliness, total suffering, where there's nothing but the eternal conscious suffering and lament of every inhabitant of hell. Conscious, never-ending, lamentable wailing and suffering. Conscious. Those who inhabit hell have their conscious faculties so that they can remember every time they heard the gospel and said no. Every time someone tried to share with them, they said no. Every time they came to church and were convicted, they said no. 
Now, that's just the bad news. How can it get worse? Well, the worst news is you and I can't do anything about that. A lost person can't raise themselves up from death and sin and trespass. A lost person can't free themselves from their slavery of sin and the dominion of Satan over their lives. A lost person cannot transform their lives so that they can deliver themselves from the strongholds of the lustful desires of the flesh and the mind. And a lost person on their own can't change their direction for destiny toward the, what they will receive at the end of their life. We, we can't change our eternal destiny. That's the worst news. Well, then you get to verse 4. And God invades. God brings the answer. The very God who created us, the very God against whom we've sinned and rebelled and created a great penalty of trespass against God and made ourselves deserving of the wrath of God, God in his grace and in mercy puts the conjunction but in verse 4 so that he can undo what we can. And so there are four things that I find in this particular area passage. This, to me, well, let me, let me come back before I give you the best news. Let me give you the, the good news. Here's the gospel. Uh, let, me, let me quote David Platt for you. David um, tried to write um, the gospel in one sentence. And David, I mean, he's got more degrees than Fahrenheit, so he's pretty smart. So here's what he said. He said, here is the gospel. And then he, he said this. That almighty creator God has looked upon hopelessly sinful people. And in grace and mercy and compassion. Sent a savior. His only son, Jesus Christ, God in flesh. Born of the Virgin Mary. Lived a sinless life. Fulfilled all righteousness of the law. And died on a cross in our place and for our sin. To fulfill... God's penalty for our sin and to take upon himself the punishment of God for our sin. He was buried and was raised from the dead to show God's power over sin so that whoever calls on the name of the Lord can be saved. Now that's a tremendous explanation of the gospel. It tells us about who God is. It tells us about our disobedience. It tells us about our need. It talks about God's remedy in sending his son, Jesus Christ. It tells about the death of Christ, the burial of Christ, the resurrection of the Christ, and the great promise of God that whoever calls on the name of the Lord can be saved. So here are four things very quickly. Let me just give them to you here um, from Ephesians 2, 4 through 10. God is not reluctant to save sinners. It says in verse 4, but God who is rich in mercy. God is not reluctant. God is not reticent. When we move down to, the, to what we call the farm, which is nothing more but a house on eight acres, and most of that acres is a, is a lawn, which requires a lawn mower. Uh, I knew that I was going to have to be cutting grass, and I travel a lot. I'm hardly ever home, and I didn't want to pay somebody to do it. And so I bought a lawn mower, uh, Husqvarna Zero Turn Radius 54 Inch Cut, because <laughs> we've got to do it right. And so I. I I, sh I reluctantly shelled out that money uh, to my friend Keith Goble, and I, I brought that Husqvarna. And uh, first, first part of the real growing season, I got to cut my own grass uh, in late September this past year. Uh, I got on the mower at 9 o'clock. I got off at 4 o'clock. And Jeannie said, why don't you buy me a lawnmower? That's my wife. And I thought about how much I'd pay for mine, and I said, I just, I'm reluctant to pour, I'm just reluctant to do that. And then I thought about how many hours I was on that lawnmower, and I said, okay. But I got news. God is not reluctant to lavish us with his grace. God is not reticent to save sinners. God doesn't say, oh, you know, I'm just, I'm limited on how much grace I've got, and and uh, maybe this person or that person I'll say, but this one's been so bad, I, I'm just reluctant to say, listen, all of us need the abundant grace of God for his salvation. And the Bible says in Ephesians 1, 6 and 7 that God 
is rich. He is lavish in his grace. And so God wants to pour out lavish, saving grace on sinners. He's rich in mercy. Second thing is God is not ashamed to save sinners. But God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. Even while we were dead in our sin and trespass. Now the Bible says that God knows everything about us. Even it, the Bible says he knows all of our days before there are any of them. And so before you were born, really, before God even created dirt, God already knew everything about your life. He knew all the good you would do. He also knew the bad you would do. He knew the sin you would commit. He already knew about all the sin you've committed in your life now, past, present, future. He's very aware of that. And that's why he planned also to give a redeemer, a savior, a, sa a substitutionary sacrifice, the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, who takes away the sins of the world. And knowing everything about us, knowing all of our sin, he still set his love and affection upon us. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love, with which he loved us even while we were dead in our sin and trespass. So I've got news. You did not start the process of salvation in your life. God started that process. John tells us we did not love him, but he first loved us. And so please understand that it's God working in you. It's God drawing you to himself. It's God showing you his gospel. It's God convicting you of sin and your need for a savior. It's God working gloriously, masterfully, wonderfully, powerfully, lovingly, graciously for undeserving sinners such as we. Now, the third thing is God is not challenged to save us. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love of which he loved us, even while we were dead in our sin and trespass, he has raised us up together and made us alive together in Christ by grace and been saved. It's not, God's not challenged to save sinners. God, God doesn't you know, God doesn't look and say, oh, you know, that one I can save. That, this one's going to be hard. Nothing's hard for God. He raised his son, Jesus Christ, from the dead in the greatest display of power ever known to man. Satan is in a tomb. I'm sorry, Satan. The Savior is in a tomb. Jesus is in a tomb. The stone is keep him in the grave. The seal of the Roman government is keeping him in the grave. The Roman soldiers are keeping him in the grave, and Satan is leaning on that rock, keeping him in the grave. Day one, nothing. Day two, nothing. But come that third day, God called forth his son by name, and up from the grave he arose. And so that great power, that victorious power, that overcoming power, is the power by which God raises up we sinners from death and sin and trespass makes us alive together in Christ and seeks us in Christ on his right hand in heavenly places. So that, so that when he views us through the eyes of the Lord Jesus, he sees us as holy and blameless and above reproach. For Christ was offered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. There's a fourth thing, and I'll mention it quickly because I've got to I've got five minutes left, and I've got to give you this good stuff here. Some of us, since the day we were saved, have messed up. Don't point. But some of I say some of us, all of us that are saved in this room, have messed up. And Satan wants us to believe the lie that maybe when we were saved, God loved us to the same standard as Christ, but... Because we've sinned against him, even as believers, God's love for us is diminished. And that's a lie. Jesus prayed in John 17, 23, said, Father, I pray that they will know that you love them even to the same measure as you have loved me. So the fourth thing is this. God does not regret saving you. He doesn't regret it. We see that picture in the parable of the prodigal son. The father doesn't run out to the son and say to the son when he finally comes home, having come to himself, returned to his father, he doesn't say, I, I, I just regret that you were ever my son. 
He lavishes him with his love. My friend, that is the heart of Almighty God. So there's your bad news, worst news, good news, best news. Now let me, let me land the plane here. In Acts 4.31, it said, the Bible says, And when they had finished praying, the place where they were assembled together was shaken. They were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. How do I overcome the fear of sharing the gospel? Well, we know the Bible says that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power of love and of a sound mind. How do I, in God's power, overcome any fear or trepidation, reluctance or reticence, in sharing the gospel? Everywhere I go and everywhere I preach and everywhere I teach and I'm doing training and everything on a personal evangelism, I always start with this one. Start praying for those lost people by name. Start praying for them by name. Paul wrote in Romans 10, 1, inspired of God, my heart's desire and prayer for them is that they be saved. I have a 35-year-old son. He has a 30-year-old girlfriend. He works with his best friend who's a 32-year-old guy in the entertainment industry. And all three of them are not sure that God exists. So don't you think I learned how to pray for lost people by name and do it regularly? And we say, well, you know, it's so hard to share the gospel with your family. I got news. The more you pray for lost people by name, the more confident God will make you in sharing the gospel. So here, here's, I'll just, and I'll send these notes to your pastor if you want them. If he wants, you know, he can let me know and I'll email them to him. But here's what, you're entering into spiritual warfare when you begin praying for lost people by name. So you better be positive of your own salvation. You can't pray for someone to get what you don't have any better than you can come back from a place you've never been. You better be pure of heart. Psalm 66, 18 says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear to answer my prayer. You better be persistent in praying. Because sometimes when you're praying for lost people, they start acting loster. And you better pray prepared to share the gospel. And you may not be given the opportunity to share the gospel with that person you're praying for. But God may give you the opportunity to share the gospel with someone else that someone else is praying for. Be prepared to share the gospel. Now, how do I pray? I pray through the work of God in salvation. I don't follow each one of these little steps every time I pray. Uh, I pray for, for Joshua. I pray for Emily. I pray for Michael. I pray for Buddy. I pray for Lawton. I pray for Kelly. I pray for Savannah. I pray for Jason. Those are eight. I can't remember if I used that finger or not. There's eight or nine people right there that I pray for just practically every day, sometimes multiple times a day. And I don't pray every one of these points, but when I'm praying for them, I, I pray, Lord, prepare their heart. I, I, I want their heart to be broken up and open, receptive to the gospel. I pray, Lord, draw them to yourself. John 6, 44, no one comes to the Father unless the Father draws them. I'm praying for the working of the Spirit of God and drawing them to God, making them aware of their need. I pray, Lord, confront them with the gospel. Whether it's they hear it, whether someone shares it, whether they read it, however, whatever medium God uses, that they'll be confronted with the truth of the gospel. Because Satan has got their minds veiled in ignorance. And my prayer is that God will break through that darkness of their mind with the glorious light of the gospel of Christ that they may be saved. Now, after I pray that they'll be confronted with the gospel, I pray what happens next, and that is that they'll be convicted of their sin, convinced of their need for a Savior. I don't beat anybody up with my Bible. I lovingly, compassionately, confidently share what the Bible says. I was preaching the other night um, somewhere, uh, Whigham, Georgia. You got to want it. <laughs> and uh, great church, a great pastor, young guy. And um, I was preaching on um, the last, the last judgment. 
and the judgment of believers and judgment of unbelievers. I had a guy down here and his girlfriend that somebody had invited. I knew that uh, they were a church, and, and by all uh, conversations, they were lost. They didn't believe they were just there reluctant because they promised they'd go to the night of revival. And here I am preaching about the judgment of believers within the judgment of unbelievers, the great white throne judgment of God, and it's just really heavy stuff. And I can see that guy just shaking his head. Ah, yeah. eh. Now, I got news. Um, used to, that threw me off my game. Used to say, oh, I don't want to offend them. But I got news. I'm not offended. If they're offended, they're offended by the gospel truth. I'm not going to preach it mad. I'm not going to be angry. I'm not going to be critical. I'm going to lovingly, compassionately proclaim the gospel. And I want them to be, because it's only by the proclamation of the gospel do they hear the truth and become convicted of their sin before holy God. And I don't want them just convicted of their sin. I want them convinced of their need for a Savior. And that Savior is Jesus Christ. I pray God, rescue and redeem them. Two of my favorite verses, Colossians 1, 13 and 14 says, But God has rescued us from the power of darkness, transferred, transplanted us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. Now, I can pray with confidence on those things because I know that's the word of God. The Bible says in 1 John 5, 14, 15, and this is the confidence that we have in him. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if he hears us, whatever we ask, we know we should receive those things we've asked of him. So I'm going to pray according to the word of God. And so um, when I pray, I, I, I remember uh, I remember to pray according to the greatness of God's grace. The abundant, lavish grace that God has. The undeserved, unmerited favor that God wants to lavish upon sinners. I pray according to the forgiveness of God. We're here at this time of Christmas. At Christmas, Easter. These are not poinsettias, are they? <laughs> We're here at Easter. Good Friday is coming up. Today was Palm Sunday. A few days we'll re remember the fact that Jesus went to the cross. And while on the cross, Colossians 2, 13 and 14 says that God took the outstanding record of debt, the certificate, certificate of debt, the penalty debt of my sin out of the way and he nailed it to the cross of Christ. And Jesus paid the penalty of my sin with the giving of his life, with the shedding of his blood. But while he's on the cross, not only does Jesus in my place and for my sin pay for my penalty, he suffers the punishment due me. The wrath of God is exhausted by God upon his son, Jesus Christ. The fullness of the wrath of God due me for my sin is poured out instead upon his son, Jesus Christ. God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us. That we might become the righteousness of God in him. So that Paul could write Romans 8, 1, inspired of God, there's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And I pray according to the promises of God. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, I, I ask the pastor we conclude our time together tonight, and I apologize for going over which is simply to say, I had more to say than I had time for, so thank you for being patient with me. But I want to give you an opportunity real quickly right now as we conclude the service. I'm going to ask our pianist if he'll go to the piano, and he's going to play a song in just a moment. In a moment, I'm going to ask you to stand. In a moment, I'm going to give you some simple instructions. And I would dare say that now, during this time, you've been thinking about the folks that you're going to invite to Easter. You've been thinking about how one day you might have the opportunity to what you would say if you shared with them the gospel and the power of God for the glory of God. But we're going to do step one tonight, and that's just begin praying for them by name. Now, I'm not going to ask you to go through this whole process that sort of quickly outlined for you. But I think it would be wonderful tonight in a moment as we stand, in a moment as we pray, just as the penis plays, if you would... Would like, I'd like for you to just come and stand or kneel at this altar area or sit on the front pew, however you're most comfortable, and just say, Father, I pray that so-and-so would be saved. Help me be ready to share the gospel. 
Give me courage and confidence in Christ. And then return to your seat. We're just going to begin. When you begin praying for lost people by name, you're going to grow in your confidence in sharing the gospel with other people. So let's stand together. I'm going to say a word of prayer, and then our penis will begin playing after my amen. And then just as people are praying across this worship center where they are, as many as you would like, just to come, stand or kneel, sit in the front pew, Lord, lift their name up, ask what Paul prayed, Lord, my heart's desire and prayer to you for them is that they be saved. Then return to your seats and we'll conclude in just a moment. Father, hear us as we pray, as the names of these individuals are lifted up to you. We pray the heart of Paul tonight. We pray your heart to let you know that our heart's desire and our prayer for these people is that they be saved. Hear, O God, as we pray in Jesus' name. You come as God leads. You remain standing your pastors on his way to the platform i just want you to know that i'm praying that this coming sunday as people gather together in this place to make much of jesus to exalt and worship him people who are believers people who are unbelievers will be attending and i'm praying that the manifest presence of god will be known in this place i pray for your pastor the anointing and power of the holy spirit as he proclaims the truth for the musicians the tech the singers everyone who attends that we might tie the Lord Jesus as he draws people to himself. God bless you. I love you. Thank you for letting me be here tonight. Pastor. All right. Y'all don't sit down. I'm fixing to let you go. Um, I want to challenge you. What I've, I've been doing for this month, invite someone who does not go to church. Um, sometimes we think that, well, they're saved, but they don't go to church. I, I'll just be honest with you. Pastor, for 17 years you're not going to church and you say you're a Christian you know there's that old that there's a saying that says if you're if your Christian faith can't get you to church 
How's it going to get you to heaven if you have a Christian faith? Pray for them. Invite them to come. Y'all pray for me. Uh, again, I've not landed on a message, and I'm praying that God will give me one. And y'all pray that God will just open my heart. And something that I will, I will stand in this pulpit and say, this is the one. And, and just have a confidence in what the Lord has given me. I love y'all as a church. I do. I believe that God's got some good things for us. And so y'all go out in the faith that God is doing some things. And uh, let's pray that we're going to have an awesome Sunday this next Sunday. God bless Brother Randy. Would y'all give Brother Randy a hand? Thank him for being with us. We appreciate it, Brother. You headed back to Barney? God bless you, brother. All right. Thank y'all very much. Y'all have a wonderful, wonderful evening.